January 17, 2001, dawned chilly in the city of Hutchinson, Kansas. A town of 40,000, located near the geographical center of the United States. Then, all hell broke loose. Two buildings in the heart of town were slammed by an explosion and burst into flames. The force of the explosion shattering glass a block away and the flames sending smoke twisting over the city. One store manager will never forget that day. The last thing I remember was like a rumble, like thunder. And I looked up and the ceiling tiles were all falling down. And the next thing I knew, I heard sirens. I was buried in it. When we came back, we were still in shock. Um, couldn't believe that it had happened. Our building wasn't there. There was just a huge geyser of a fire, just, you know, out of control. As firefighters worked to douse flames that reached as high as 70 feet, city officials could only guess at what might have caused the explosion and fire. We thought it was just a normal explosion due to, uh, it was cold that day, uh, that maybe some furnace malfunction and there was a leak in the, in the gas. But when officials turned off natural gas lines leading into downtown Hutchinson, the fires only seemed to burn higher and hotter. So we knew that we had something else that we had no control of and couldn't find out what was wrong. Into the evening, firefighters tried to quench the blaze that simply wouldn't go out. Then, as dusk fell, several miles east of downtown, 30-foot-tall geysers of natural gas and salt water bubbled up out of the ground. It was a strange development, and it only added to the confusion. Because while it confirmed for authorities that there was a significant underground presence of natural gas, no one knew where such massive amounts of the gas were coming from, or where fire might strike next. Officials found out the next morning, when another geyser bubbled up beneath the trailer park, found a spark, and exploded. Two people were killed in that trailer explosion. And that led to an evacuation area of about a two-mile area and a half a mile area uh, of residential people. Then people began to panic, schools were closed, mail was stopped into the area, and people wanted to know if things were under control. By that time, we had a declaration from the governor that we had a state of emergency. Kansas Gas Service, also known as K-Gas, the local gas utility company, started to drill a series of 58 boreholes to try to vent the gas. People in Hutchinson were afraid. They were scared to death. They had no idea where the next geyser was going to come up, if their house was going to blow up. The boreholes were apparently effective in venting the gas pressure. After the trailer park explosion on January 18th, there were no other explosions or fires in Hutchinson. But with two deaths and a city gripped by fear, officials were anxious to somehow establish that were flaring up and to see if there was a pattern, if they would form some kind of a line to show us where the source was at. And it indicated to us it looked like there was a source maybe coming from the west of town. Outside Hutchinson is the Yagi Gas Field, an underground storage facility. The Yagi Field is one of the hubs in the national gas storage and transportation system. There's less than, fewer than two dozen of these hubs around the country, so they're very critical parts of the natural gas infrastructure. Gas comes in by pipeline, um, and then it's sent from here out on distribution lines all over the Midwest and, and connecting up with the national grid. The Yagi storage field, which holds about 3.5 billion cubic feet of gas, was first developed in the late 1970s to store liquid propane at low pressure. At that time, engineers created about 70 long-necked gas storage holding areas, known as jugs. To create a jug, engineers drill about 600 feet down into the salt deposit and then use water to dissolve the salt and make a man-made cavern. Then the water is pumped out, leaving a stable storage place that can be sealed by cementing around the well casing. These things are large enough to hold about 100,000 barrels of fluid, 42 gallons per barrel. That's 4.2 million gallons of fluid in one of these jugs in the salt. Then, about a decade later, the company that made the jugs went out of business, and the local gas company converted the facility to hold natural gas at high pressure, rather than liquid propane at lower pressure. The change was significant, 
because higher pressure storage requires that the jugs are perfectly sealed in order to prevent leaks. Investigators believe that just before the explosions in Hutchinson, there was a pressure drop in the gas stored in a jug designated S1. This suggested the gas had exited the jug, but investigators still needed to know where it went and how it might have traveled the eight miles to Hutchinson. To answer that question, geologists from the Kansas Geological Survey deployed what are known as seismic thumper trucks to create maps of underground conditions. A thumper truck works by literally thumping the ground to send shock waves into the earth. These are bounced back to the surface with varying degrees of intensity, depending upon the nature of the material they encounter below. This enabled scientists to make detailed maps of the nether regions between the city of Hutchinson and the Yagi Field facility. Right here, it looks fairly flat. But underground, 600 feet, the rocks are dipping, and so they, they slowly incline towards the city of Hutchinson. Natural gas gets out into those rocks. It comes out of the well, comes out of the, uh, the jug. It hits that rock layer, and it wants to find the highest place. It wants to rise to the top. So it found this rock layer and found a pathway and just headed straight that way for eight miles right under downtown Hutchinson. Scientists generated geophysical maps of the underground pathway to validate their theory about the gas. They came to believe that the gas leak started in the S1 jug. To confirm this, investigators photographed the inside of the jug. They discovered that the steel casing that ran down into the salt cavern was damaged, allowing the high pressure natural gas to escape into the ground. Investigators claimed that even though there was a pressure drop at Yagi Field, operators at the gas field either ignored it or didn't detect it and kept topping off the jug keeping the high pressure constant. While gas company engineers still seek other sources for the leak that ignited Hutchinson, most independent investigators agree that the Yagi field is the most likely origin. The field's inactive. Most of the gas has been distributed out in pipelines and sold to the market. There's about 20% of the gas left as a cushion at relatively low pressures to keep the system alive, to keep the caverns open, to keep the equipment running while the company decides whether they want to apply to reopen it. Following the Hutchinson disaster, state laws were passed requiring salt caverns to be built and maintained with higher safety standards. There's also a concern that it happened once. We still don't know all of the things that went wrong. and There still may be other pathways for gas that we've never discovered. And so I think there's always going to be a reasonable doubt in many people's minds about living uphill from a facility this large with this high pressure gas. In 2004, three and a half years after the Hutchinson incident, natural gas stored in a salt cavern in Texas exploded and burned for a week before going out. Engineering disasters will return on Modern Marvels. On October 31st, 1984, around midnight, the tanker Puerto Rican was beginning a journey from San Francisco to New Orleans. It was plying its trade of calling on ports and harbors and would take chemicals into its tanks, go to its destination, offload them, take on new chemicals, and finally end up in its next destination. The problem arose, of course, when it sailed out of the Golden Gate the evening of its last voyage. Guided out of port by a pilot boat, the 632-foot-long craft carried a crew of about 30 and a cargo of nearly 92,000 barrels of lubrication oil and additives and 8,500 barrels of bunker fuel. It was a clear, dark night. Everything looked great. I was just about uh, maybe eight hours away from finishing up my work and going on a 30-day vacation. The two vessels, pilot boat and tanker, were tied together. But at 3.30 a.m., as the pilot boat skipper was preparing to disengage the tanker and return to his vessel, the night sky lit up with terrific intensity. I had my hand on the railing, and I was just about ready to go down when I heard a click, a whoosh, and a bang. I basically kind of remember the ship exploding, but I don't remember anything else till I was way up in the air. I, I must have been 200 feet up in the air. So 
as it was coming down, I actually saw the ship exploding in kaleidoscope form. It was going click, 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 like uh, it's unbelievable, like a slideshow. The Puerto Rican had turned into a fireball. Within minutes, the United States Coast Guard scrambled a rescue response. We got a report from a C-130 aircraft, which is one of our large four-engine aircraft. Uh, it was about 15 miles off the coast. And that report um, told us that there was about a 40 to 50 foot plume of flame leaping up from the vessel. And so we knew it was very, very serious. The pilot survived along with a crewman who was badly burned. But a second crewman thrown overboard by the blast was never found. The explosion had blown the tanker in half. It spilled 1.4 million gallons of oil into the bay. The timing of the disaster created special challenges for the Coast Guard, which not only had to rescue survivors, but would also try to clean up the spill. This explosion, of course, as I said, happened at night. So how much oil was in the water immediately, we couldn't even see. But at first light, we were able to see it was trailing from the vessel. And we were very much at risk of losing the entire cargo, which was about 4 million gallons. A few days later, during heavy weather, the Coast Guard's worst fears were realized. The rear portion of the vessel sank about 25 miles off the coast of San Francisco, releasing even more oil into the bay. And it took with it about 8,000 barrels of fuel oil. And uh, at the time, some of that oil leaked out and continued to leak for some time afterwards, about 20 barrels a day, I think. January 17, 2001, dawned chilly in the city of Hutchinson, Kansas. A town of 40,000 located near the geographical center of the United States. Then, all hell broke loose. Two buildings in the heart of town were slammed by an explosion and burst into flames. The force of the explosion shattering glass a block away and the flames sending smoke twisting over the city. One store manager will never forget that day. The last thing I remember was like a rumble, like thunder. And I looked up and the ceiling tiles were all falling down. And the next thing I knew, I heard sirens. I was buried in it. When we came back, we were still in shock. Um, couldn't believe that it had happened. Our building wasn't there. There was just a huge geyser of a fire. Just you know, out of control. As firefighters worked to douse flames that reached as high as 70 feet, city officials could only guess at what might have caused the explosion and fire. We thought it was just a normal explosion due to, uh, it was cold that day, uh, that maybe some furnace malfunction and there was a leak in the, in the gas. But when officials turned off natural gas lines leading into downtown Hutchinson, the fires only seemed to burn higher and hotter. So we knew that we had something else that we had no control of and couldn't find out what was wrong. Into the evening, firefighters tried to quench the blaze that simply wouldn't go out. Then, as dusk fell, several miles east of downtown, 30-foot-tall geysers of natural gas and salt water bubbled up out of the ground. It was a strange development, and it only added to the confusion. Because while it confirmed for authorities that there was a significant underground presence of natural gas, no one knew where such massive amounts of the gas were coming from, or where fire might strike next. Officials found out the next morning, when another geyser bubbled up beneath the trailer park, found a spark, and exploded. Two people were killed in that trailer explosion. And that... But as investigators would learn, it leaked from the holding tank, combined with other elements, and formed a dangerous brew. Investigators went inside and found a hole at the top of the tank. A problem they believed that occurred because one of the welders who made the tank didn't seal the seam completely. The hole burned through the tank was actually easier to find than you might think, because large expanses of a tank wall are just flat, featureless. And if you're in this business very long, you recognize that problems in workmanship don't 
come up typically in long straight areas that are easy to weld. Problems in workmanship usually manifest themselves in complex cramped geometries around corners and struts in a place that's not so accessible and not so easy for the workman to see his work. The hole in the tank was enough to provide passage into a void area between tank 5 and its neighbor 6. Eventually the bilge space became filled with a soup of caustic soda from a preceding voyage. This caustic soda soup combined with a zinc coating used in the bilge area and formed hydrogen gas. Then the hydrogen exploded, ignited by a spark of unknown origin. If hydrogen finally builds up in concentration to its lower explosive limit, it will find an ignition source. Remember, this is the same stuff in the Hindenburg. So we have this incredible conjunction of events. And indeed, in our business, we see that major disasters are very often the, string, the result of a string of very low probability events that just all come together bad that day. The Puerto Rican tanker explosion had implications for the U.S. Coast Guard, which improved its response to hazardous material spills. And although authorities acknowledge that the explosion was a freak accident, the disaster did create change in the shipping industry. The Marine Board of Investigation uh, suggested that there were preventative measures that could have been taken to prevent this explosion in the first place. Better inspection techniques, perhaps during the yard period or other opportunities the vessel had to be inspected, may have found uh, this gouge and it could have been repaired. You gotta start looking for things like if volumes of cargo start disappearing in voyages, and in this particular case, they were, in the case of the ship, this cannot go without some affirmative action. And indeed, it would be very straightforward to determine you've got a leak because cargo is showing up in the bilge water. If those determinations had been made, then the leak would have been located. It just would have been a matter of time. As many as 126,000 gallons of caustic soda were estimated to have been lost in the bilge of the tanker Puerto Rican before it exploded. Engineering Disasters will return on Modern Marvels. In 2003, the gambling town of Atlantic City, New Jersey, was showing its age, and many believed it was in need of a facelift. The Tropicana organization stepped in with a new development intended to lure more gamblers to the Jersey Shore. Construction began on a $245 million project a new 18-story hotel next to the Tropicana Casino, as well as an attached 2,400-space parking structure. It was one of the biggest projects in Atlantic City in a decade. Local officials and Tropicana executives were saying how big this is going to be for the area. It's going to be the largest hotel in the state of New Jersey. It's going to bring jobs to the area. It was of critical importance to the city and to the state and to the casino. Um, it had the economic fortunes of uh, workers and businesses tied to it. Feeling the pressure, contractors put the Tropicana structure on a rush status to complete the work by March 2004. On the morning of October 30th, a work crew was eight parking levels up, preparing to pour concrete. On many construction sites, this is done by means of a crane-mounted hose. In the old days, uh, workers would haul up concrete in buckets or in wheelbarrows. It's become much more modern these days. It's pumped. Uh, a pump takes it up through a tube and then out through a hose so you could place it eight, nine floors high. Wet concrete puts great stress on structures. In the case of the Tropicana, engineers estimate that stress rose to 160 pounds per square foot on the framed out floor area while the concrete was being poured. At about 10.40 in the morning, workers knew that something was wrong. They hear a noise and something shift. Some of the men have described it that they're just sort of, they're just sort of looking at each other like, did you hear or feel that? And then everything begins to collapse and fall in. Within moments, five floor slabs collapsed progressively. They severed from a shear wall that remained standing after the collapse. 
when it cracked like that, I just went straight down. And it looks like, you know, flying like I'm just floating in there and reaching, just trying to reach for something. Warren Webb rode the collapse down and was hospitalized with a severed hamstring, additional leg injuries, and a rotator cuff tear. Other workers were missing, however, and rescue personnel searched the collapsed structure for signs of life. When the last ambulance left the scene, the grim statistics were four workers killed, more than 20 injured. The reaction was intense. News stations carried it live. Family members whose husbands or wives uh, were working here flocked to the scene to make sure that their loved ones got out alive. But soon after the tragedy, reports emerged that at the parking garage, there had been early signs of trouble. We interviewed two workers who had been inside the garage weeks prior to the collapse. And what they had noticed were large cracks in the columns. And they said they reported those large cracks to their supervisors. OSHA itself, uh, in its press conference announcing its citations, indicated that there were reports of several areas of cracked concrete on the uh, construction project. And OSHA indicated that this should have raised in what OSHA described as red flags uh, for the people involved in the construction process. In the days following the collapse, OSHA investigators and police sifted through the wreckage, looking for clues into how the structure failed. They knew the stresses created by wet concrete could push structures beyond their capabilities. And the amount of stress that it puts on the structure is enormous because it is when the structure will be stressed the most. Pumping concrete through a hose is common and considered safe if done with proper structural support. When the project began, iron workers on the lower floors were threading reinforcing steel, known as rebar, through the floor and connecting the ends with additional pieces of rebar placed in the six vertical columns at the perimeter of the garage. That steel is literally getting tied together and then when the concrete hardens, you have a substantial steel rods coming in from either direction tied together, giving you a great structural member there uh, that you could rely on. But then, according to OSHA and lawyers for the Tropicana victims, the project plans were changed to allow for the use of a different kind of rebar fabrication. Rebar mesh is a waffle weave of metal that is prefabricated, pre-cut, and simply dropped in place. Obviously, the more you can do things off-site uh, and not in the field, the cheaper it's going to be. Uh, if you can eliminate rod setters uh, tying pieces of rebar together and that's going to save you money, there's an economic incentive for companies to do that. According to OSHA investigators, the contractors also revised their plan for support beams, making them shallower and potentially weaker. Investigators say the unfortunate result was a structure that was substantially weaker than designed. OSHA concluded that the accident occurred for two basic reasons, that there was a lack of shoring and structural support, and that there was a lack of uh, connections between the floors and the walls. Connecting horizontal steel to the vertical is a basic construction engineering design. It's very basic. Since the time of early man, uh, once they started building structures, they knew that if you don't have the wall and the floor joined together, they're not going to be joined together for long. On April 29, 2004, OSHA fined the participating contractors $119,000, and the contractors stated their intention to file appeals. Victims of the disaster believed the system failed them. We believe that if this job had been adequately inspected, this accident would not have occurred. In the rush to build to a tight time frame, investigators believe a seemingly obvious principle of construction was ignored by the Tropicana's engineers. OSHA officials claim the walls and floors were not properly connected. That's why the OSHA director, in discussing this catastrophe, described it as a failure of basic engineering 101. According to federal statistics, a fall from one level to another is the most common cause of death on commercial building construction sites. Engineering disasters will return on Modern Marvels. In Russia's Great Northwest, White Sea 
an inlet to the Bering Sea, down to Lake Onega on the Finnish border. Snow is on the ground for more than 160 days a year, and icebreakers are required to keep shipping lanes open in winter. This unforgiving landscape was an unwelcome home to an engineering project doomed to disaster. In 1932, Russia was in the brutal grip of Soviet communism. The Soviet dictator, Joseph Stalin, was consolidating his power, rounding up enemies of the state in a process called collectivization. There had been mass arrests uh, with, throughout the countryside and throughout the cities as well of people who didn't want to cooperate with the new order, who didn't want to collaborate with the collectivization. As a part of this process, the Soviet government identified people whom it considered to be rich peasants and then were either arrested or exiled to remote parts of Siberia. Stalin wanted to use the prisoners for propaganda purposes and decided to force them to work on grandiose public works projects. The first was the 140-mile-long White Sea Canal. It would allow for the strategic movement of Soviet ships and would create a new passage for commercial vessels. The canal was to extend from Povonets at the northern end of Lake Onega up to the White Sea with its important port city of Arkhangelsk. The route had a 229-foot difference in water level. This required a system of 19 locks to raise and lower water levels so that ships could pass. Stalin gave his engineers just 20 months to complete the job. Everyone involved with the project understood that when Stalin set a timetable, then you better stick to it. The project would begin what became known as the Gulag system, with workers living in nine camps along the route, working 16-hour days. The Gulag is a, a Soviet acronym, which means a state administration of camps. And the Gulag is simply a bureaucracy. It comes to be synonymous with the concentration camp system. They had hundreds of thousands of people who'd been jailed. What should we do with them? Well, we can't use them on farms. Let's start them on this grand project. While the intended purpose of the White Sea Canal was both military and economic, perhaps more important was its propaganda value. There were films made, there were books written, there were newspaper articles done with interviewing people who would say things like, I came into the camp as a hardened criminal and I emerge now as a good Soviet person. It's a showpiece. It's a showpiece for Soviet power. It's a showpiece to prove to the world and to Soviet citizens that the socialist economy was better, stronger, and could do things more quickly and do things that people had only dreamed of. But as work started, the engineering challenges only seemed to worsen. No geologic survey maps existed for large portions of the proposed canal, so engineers had no way of knowing soil conditions to help plan their excavations. They found to their dismay that workers would have to dig through 23 miles of solid granite to make the canal. Timber, readily available in the forested region, was the primary construction material. But in the interest of efficiency, any iron required was to be forged on site. Stalin insisted that the project stay on budget. One way of cutting costs was to have convicts be employed in all phases of the construction, not just in terms of the labor, the unskilled labor, but also the skilled labor, meaning the engineers, the design. This was done by convict labor. The working conditions on the White Sea Canal were stunningly primitive. Um, I've actually been to a museum up near the canal which preserves some of the tools that people used to, to work on it. And they include things like bits of metal, 
wrap, sort of stuck onto sticks, and that was what they used for hammers. There were hardly any machines used. Um, everything was done by hand, including all the breaking up of the rocks, all the digging, all the moving around of material and so on. Another cost-cutting measure was to reduce rations. In winter, they had to be housed and they had to be fed. They, didn't, they had very small rations. It was a, a very nasty experience. About 100,000 people worked on the project during the 30 months that it took to complete. Of these, about 25,000 people are thought to have died. It cost many lives, but Stalin's canal opened on May 28, 1933. But there was a hitch in the plan to make it a symbol of Soviet success. The White Sea Canal was practically useless. One problem is that in order to uh, build the canal this cheaply, this, the decision is made to build it not as deeply as it should have been built. So instead of being built at a depth of 18 feet, it was built at a depth of between 10 and 12 feet. Most Soviet naval vessels had a draw of more than 12 feet, making passage through the canal impossible. Soviet engineers later learned they had made more disastrous decisions. The walls of the locks, being made of wood, crumbled, and the locks failed. Even the location turned out to be bad. The waters of the canal were frozen nearly half the year. Still, Stalin pretended the canal was a success. The fact that it didn't work very well was never widely advertised. This project was hailed as a tremendous success. Stalin himself was very proud of it. After World War II, the canal was rebuilt with better walls and metal gates over the locks. But it's still too shallow for ocean-going vessels and receives light traffic today. I myself went up there and I saw maybe five or six ships in the course of an afternoon and I talked to some of the people who worked there and they said, oh yes, we get the occasional barge coming through. But it's never been of major commercial use or major military use. A dictator's megalomania prompted poor engineering decisions that included forging ahead without a proper survey, working without proper tools or skilled personnel. And the Soviet supreme leader required that the truth about the disaster be concealed for decades. When Stalin died 20 years later, other gulag projects were abandoned as hopelessly impractical. Workers on the White Sea Canal project forged more than a thousand tons of iron in handmade furnaces, partly made of wood. Engineering disasters will return on Modern Marvels. It's abandoned, overgrown, choked with weeds. But amid rusting storage tanks and pipes that lead nowhere, discarded boxes of pesticide hold clues to one of the world's worst industrial disasters. It happened on Monday, December 3rd, 1984, when the night air carried a toxic cloud. It was 400 miles south of New Delhi, in a city with a name that would become synonymous with tragedy, Bhopal, India. In a shanty town surrounding a chemical manufacturing plant, residents had no warning the death was virtually upon them. Sleepers were jolted awake, choking on poison and rubbing their stinging eyes. By first light, the cloud had cleared away and many victims were doomed or already dead. Eventually, officials would report 3,800 fatalities with 11,000 disabled with severe respiratory ailments. We don't believe there was an alarm system in place at Bhopal, not a public alarm system. I, I believe there was an alarm system within the, within the factory itself, but there was no siren or public alarm that would alert the surrounding population to the threat of any potential hazard from the plant. Bhopal plant officials, however, say they sounded a toxic gas alarm for about five minutes. The Bhopal plant was run by an Indian subsidiary of Union Carbide a U.S.-based multinational corporation. The plant manufactured a pesticide called Seven, using an extremely toxic chemical, MIC, methyl isocyanate. 
It was MIC that escaped that night and poisoned residents in their sleep. In the 15 years the plant had been in operation before the disaster, there had been warning signs of trouble ahead, signs that may have been ignored. Accidents didn't happen each day, but they became fairly routine. Minor leaks of, of gas. Uh, there had been leaks of phosgene gas, which is also deadly, although not as uh, deadly perhaps as MIC. After the methyl isocyanate tragedy, separate investigations were launched by the government of India, by scores of journalists, and also Union Carbide. Conflicting theories emerged. One of the explanations is that the workers were, were flushing equipment uh, with water. The water um, passed through a valve which was supposed to be closed but did not close all the way. Flushing with water or water washing was a normal maintenance procedure at Bhopal. At the time of the tragedy, the plant had been in standby mode for more than a month, not actively producing MIC because of the lack of demand for pest control in the winter. We know that the water washing started something like 10.30 p.m. at night and continued till approximately 11.30. We know that this water washing was taking place. Common sense tells you that is the strongest possibility of how the water actually entered the tank. Although routine, flushing the equipment can be a dangerous procedure because MIC reacts explosively when large amounts of it come into contact with water. The MIC tanks at Bhopal, three in all, were partially buried in the ground for stability. Each tank held about 45 tons of the chemical, making the plant among the largest MIC storage facilities in the world. When this reaction took place uh, within that storage tank number 610, it took place with uh, such an explosive violence and force that the concrete tank literally lifted up, rupturing the concrete casing. And, and broke through the surface. The Indian government's investigation found that when the MIC reacted, 27 tons of poison vapor and 14 tons of reaction byproducts were sent into the air for at least 90 minutes. Indian government investigators believe that a Bhopal plant worker failed to follow a safety procedure and didn't insert a piece of metal called a slip blind into a crucial valve. A slip line would slide in between so basically a solid wall uh, in the pipe. It would be not possible to, for water to get past a slip line. The Indian investigators also believe that the reaction was worsened because valves were poorly maintained and became clogged. These valves would have allowed the water to drain harmlessly away from the tank. They also pointed out that the cooling unit that serviced tank 610 was turned off making the MIC inside even more reactive. In contrast, Union Carbide's investigators came up with a different explanation for the Bhopal disaster. While they too believed the core problem was water contamination, they theorized that a disgruntled employee introduced water into the tank. This is exactly the kind of candidate who would have committed a particular act uh, intending one result and yet causing another in, in the sense of intending to cause mischief uh, and or spoiling a batch of, of MIC by introducing water and yet not, not fully appreciating the consequences of his act. Journalists pointed to a larger systematic pattern of failures concerning the plant's site location, design, and day-to-day -day operations. A lot of people want to reduce this to some guy opened a valve and he shouldn't have. But that's not what happened. First of all, this whole plant was designed incorrectly. It was a time bomb waiting to explode because number one, methyl isocyanide, a very deadly chemical, was used. The other decision that was made that's very crucial is MIC was stored in very large tanks. Therefore, if something went wrong, you had a massive disaster instead of a, of a bad accident, but not a massive catastrophe. A comprehensive review of Bhopal investigations was initiated by a group of chemical companies, including Dow Chemical, which acquired Union Carbide in 1999. The group called the Center for Chemical Process Safety, emphasized in its review 
The crucial equipment at the plant was not working because of poor maintenance or was just not turned on. The equipment included a device called a scrubber that could have chemically destroyed the MIC gases as they spewed from the tank. The scrubber was not operating that evening. It could have been. It was possible to have turned it on, but, but during the course of the event, uh, the operators did not turn it on. Past the scrubber, there was also a process flare, which could have burned off the MIC that was being emitted. But also, the, the process flare was not operating that day. So there was a number of safeguards that, that could have been and should have been in place, um, but, but they were not. The Center for Chemical Process Safety's review suggested that the disaster proceeded from a cascading series of failures, originating in the way the plant was run. You have to go back to the root cause, and uh, in, in a case like this, I, I, I believe it would be typical to find that uh, there was some kind of management uh, failure that sits at the root cause of, of the problem. That may not be the only uh, uh, root cause, but it certainly is likely to be one of them. If any one of these measures, for example, the design of the plant, the design of the safety systems, the uh, effort to maintain the plant, the effort to turn on the uh, safety devices, if any one of these had been done, it would have contributed greatly to minimizing the kind of damage, death, and destruction that resulted from the gas leaks. Union Carbide paid a $470 million settlement to the government of India. But legal delays, including identifying some of the victims, have slowed the payout rate to a crawl. The release of the poison gas over Bhopal became an even greater disaster because of the close proximity of slums built up around the plant. Some health investigators estimate that since the disaster, as many as 50,000 people have sustained significant respiratory injuries from exposure to airborne and waterborne poisons. Bhopal has forced chemical plant designers to find ways to safely store MIC. Today, plants that use MIC employ auxiliary emergency dump tanks. These can be used to divert large amounts of the chemical away from contaminated areas. Two decades later, the city of Bhopal is still a toxic site, with scientists documenting widespread contamination of groundwater supplies. It is a tragic legacy to an incident that experts acknowledge was the worst industrial disaster in history.